Elizabeth Blackwell, a pioneering physician. What do you want to be when you grow up? When six-year-old Elizabeth Blackwell was asked that question, she stuck out her chin and replied, I don't know what I'm going to be, but I think it will be something hard. The little girl was right. She grew up to become a doctor. That is hard enough. But Elizabeth Blackwell was not only a doctor. She was also a pioneer. That doesn't mean that she traveled west in a covered wagon. It means that she led the way for others by being the first to do something new and difficult. As you will see, what she did turned out to be very hard to do, harder perhaps than she ever imagined. Young Elizabeth Blackwell grasped the rail of the rolling ship. Her face was pale, her legs wobbled as if they were made of jelly. It was the year 1832, and the 11-year-old girl had been seasick almost every day since she and her family had left England. But as she breathed in the fresh air, her eyes brightened. The sun brought color back to her cheeks. Bessie, called Elizabeth's father, striding across the deck, are you all right? Many of the passengers in first class had been seasick, and Samuel Blackwell was worried about his daughter. Yes, Papa, Elizabeth replied. I feel better out here. Then she frowned. Tell me, how many more days will it take us to reach America? Not many, Mr. Blackwell said. Don't worry, Bessie. Once we land in America, you'll run around and play as though you were never ill. It isn't me I'm worried about, said Elizabeth. I'm just seasick. But the captain said that the people in the steerage have cholera. Yes, said her father. That's true. Oh, Papa, said Elizabeth. It's dark and dirty down there. The people can't come up and stand in the sunlight. I heard the captain say that almost half of them have died, and there's no doctor to help them. Mr. Blackwell looked in his daughter's eyes and asked, What do you think should be done? Someone needs to help them, Elizabeth cried. Papa, you always say that everyone is equal, whether they're black or white, men or women, rich or poor. So why should the poor people in steerage die while everyone on our deck stays healthy? Bessie, said Mr. Blackwell gently, on almost every long sea voyage, people come down with cholera. Elizabeth gazed out over the sea. Then there must be something causing people to get sick, she said. If doctors could find out what it is, they could tell people about it and teach them how to stay healthy. Then people wouldn't get sick in the first place. The little girl turned to her father, and I shall do it. She said firmly, when I grow up, I will be a doctor. I will help anyone in need, and I will teach people how to stay healthy. Mr. Blackwell nodded. I believe you can, Bessie. I know you can. But most people who lived during Elizabeth's time did not agree with Mr. Blackwell. They thought that when girls grew up, it was all right for them to be servants or to work on farms or in factories, but women weren't allowed to become lawyers, bankers, or doctors, or to hold other jobs that were just for men. Back then, girls received little education. They were not allowed to go to good schools. Many girls did not go to school at all. Why waste a good education on a girl, people said. After all, no women can do a job as well as a man. But Mr. Blackwell disagreed. He taught Elizabeth and his other children that all people should have equal rights. He believed that a woman could do a job as well as a man. He taught his daughter subjects that only boys learn in school, such as history and math, and he encouraged his daughters to be whatever they wanted to be. Elizabeth wanted to be a doctor. She read all the books she could find. She studied with doctors to learn how about the human body. She talked with scientists to learn how medicines were made and how they work. Finally, Elizabeth decided to apply to medical school. Most people said, a woman doctor? That's ridiculous. Women were not supposed to go to college in Elizabeth's time. They certainly were not supposed to be doctors. But Elizabeth was determined. She applied to 29 medical schools. 
28 of the schools said no. Then, on a crisp October day, she received a letter. Her fingers trembled as she opened the flap. As she read the message, her face lit up. Geneva Medical College, a small school in New York City, had accepted her. I will be a doctor, she cried and ran inside to pack her bags. But Elizabeth's struggle had just begun. Many of the students, teachers, and townspeople were shocked and angry when she arrived. Some people called her names. One teacher refused to let Elizabeth into his classroom. The townspeople stared at her and muttered rude things about her. Some children even chased her through the streets, screeching, Doctor in petticoats, doctor in petticoats. Elizabeth was frustrated, but she did not give up. As she walked to and from her classes, she recited the names of bones and muscles. She studied her books until she, her tallest candle melted into a puddle of wax. She quickly became the best student in her class, and through it all, she stayed calm and spoke kindly to everyone. Slowly, her courage and determination won the people's respect and friendship. At last, the day came for Elizabeth to graduate. In the morning, she and her brother Henry slipped into the church where the ceremony would be held. When they arrived, many of the seats were already filled with curious women, whispering excitedly to each other. The two took their seats by the aisle. As the graduates entered the church, the organist began to play. Elizabeth stood and walked to the front row of seats with her fellow classmates. In groups, in groups of four, all the men were called up to receive their diplomas. Elizabeth was called up last of all and alone. The president of the college took off his hat and presented her with her diploma. Elizabeth bowed and turned to go back to her seat. Then suddenly she said to the president, Sir, I thank you. By the help of the Most High, it shall be the effort of my life to shed honor upon your diploma. Elizabeth bowed to the president of the college, and he bowed to her. The audience burst into applause. Then Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell took her seat with her fellow doctors at the front of the church. She had just become the first woman to graduate from a medical college, the first woman doctor. After she graduated, Dr. Blackwell worked for a while in hospitals in France and England. In 1851, she returned to the United States. No hospital would hire her, so she bought a house, and there she took care of sick women and children. She also wrote books that showed people how to stay healthy. She encouraged them to eat right and keep things clean. She also told people not to wait until they were very sick to go to the doctor. She called her teachings preventative medicine. She wanted to prevent disease to stop it before it started. Even better than curing ill is seeing that ills do not happen in the first place, she said. Elizabeth had not forgotten the poor people in the ship that carried her to America so many years before. Poor women and children need good hospitals, too, she thought. I will build a place where they can come to get well. She rented a room in one of the poorest neighborhoods in New York City. Trash was piled up in the front yard. The front door hung on one hinge and banged in the wind. Inside the room was dirty and bare. Isn't there a nicer, cleaner place where we might start a hospital? Asked the woman who was helping Elizabeth. No, Elizabeth replied. Good health can start anywhere, and it is needed right and it is most needed right here. She and her friends cleared the trash out of the yard. They fixed the door, they cleaned and painted the little room, and tacked up pretty curtains. Caring families donated chairs, a desk, a table, and a cot. Elizabeth put her heavy medical books on one shelf. She placed medicines and bandages on another. She polished her med medical instruments and tucked them away in a drawer. Then she threw open the door of the clinic. For many days, no one came. Then one morning, Elizabeth saw an old woman walking slowly toward the door. She held one arm tightly against her side. Her face was twisted with pain. The old woman opened the door. She peered into the cheerful room and saw only Elizabeth sitting at her desk. Is there no doctor here? She asked. Elizabeth replied, I am the doctor. Come in. I can help you. Elizabeth helped the old woman get better. After a few days, the old woman returned, leading her sick grandchild by the hand. Behind her huddled a dozen more sick people. 
Soon, Elizabeth had a line of patients stretching down the block. Many of them had never visited a doctor in their lives. Elizabeth helped them get well. Then, she visited their homes to teach them about healthy living. She also got help from a welcome friend, her sister, Emily Blackwell. Emily had just graduated from medical school. She, too, had become a doctor. The sister's little clinic grew to become the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children. Here, Elizabeth also started the Women's Medical College to train more women to become doctors. Following in the footsteps of Elizabeth Blackwell, thousands of women have become doctors. The determined little girl did indeed grow up to do something hard. Looking back on her life, Dr. Blackwell said, It is not easy to be a pioneer, but oh, it is fascinating. I would not trade one moment, even the worst moment, for all the riches in the world.